Hello, welcome back to Cracking the Cryptic. Now, I have been looking forward to making this video because uh, this this puzzle uh, appeared in a slightly different guise on our Twitter account yesterday morning. Uh, so our Twitter is at Cryptic Cracking, for those of you who don't follow us already. And I was immediately intrigued when I saw it because, well, as you can see by looking at it, how can this possibly be solvable? Um, it's a partial killer Sudoku with an irregularly shaped grid with no given digits at all. Um, so it looks absolutely impossible. But a few moments thought actually shows that there is a way of solving this puzzle and it is just a beautiful idea. I, I have to say, I absolutely love this and Andrew Osborne who came up with it deserves all the plaudits in the world. Um, now, I will also confess I have solved this puzzle already. Now, the reason is that when it appeared on my Twitter account, um, I could see that there might be a problem with it uh, because I've done enough irregular, irregular Sudokus to, um, to notice such things and therefore we had to have a bit of a back and forward to make sure that it worked. Now, this puzzle does work, um, but some of you I know will be staring at this immediately spotting the trick. So let's have a think about how we might go about it. So, you know, it's usual Sudoku rules. We need to put a one to nine in every row column in a regular shaped area. And we also have some cages. Um, now, those of you who've watched our irregular videos in the past will know that there is, you know, there's a trick you can do with irregular puzzles. You can divide the grid. You can sort of imagine vertical lines coming down like this. And we can think about the effect of that. So if we look at this cell, for example, hopefully it's not too difficult to see that the value of this cell must be the same as the value of this cell. Now, why is that? It's because we know this, this green area here contains the numbers from one to nine. So if we were to put, for example, an eight in this cell, let's just do that. If this is an eight, we know that there must, we need an eight in column one. So this square would have to be the 8. It has to sort of replenish itself. But the beautiful thing about this puzzle is let's just continue with the analysis. Let's imagine that, let's do the same trick again. Let's draw the line up here. Now what does that mean? If we were to draw an imaginary line up the grid like this, hopefully again you can see that these two squares here, we know that the first two columns of the grid have to contain the numbers from 1 to 9 exactly twice. Now we know that this green area will contain the numbers from 1 to 9 exactly once. We've got one lot of 1s to 9s and we've got seven more numbers from 1 to 9 in this blue area. But then these two cells are poking out so these two cells are going to have to be replenished by whatever we put in these two cells. Now, the interesting thing about that is that these two cells contain an 8. So the implication is that these two cells contain an 8. But where can the 8 go? It could only go in this square because there's already an 8 in row 2. And can you see what's going to happen? I'm sure you've all got there by now, but basically the implication of the shape of these irregular, uh, irregular boxes down the grid is that the, whatever we put in this top cell here propagates down the grid like this, which is really, really rather interesting. Now, if you want to try the puzzle, do click on the link under the video. Um, and we need to think about how we're going to use this sort of diagonal property to solve the puzzle. Now, if we just continue with 8, just because, why not? We know that this is going to be the shape. So we're going to have a line of 8s down here like this. Now, can we do anything with this knowledge to take us forward in the solve? Well, one of the things we could look at, I suppose, we could look at this square. Now, this square has exactly the same property that this one did, because if we sort of rotate the grid round like that, you can see that this square and this square must be the same because if we draw our imaginary line this time up the grid like this, we're going to have 
same property that we had over this this way. So if this was a nine, just to say garden, let's say this is a nine, what does this mean? Well you can see we've got exactly the same thing going on here now. If we draw the imaginary line down where the cursor is moving, these two cells have got to be the same parity as these two cells, therefore they must contain a nine. So we're going to get nines going like this long group. I, I mean, this sort of thing is the reason I love, love doing this channel because you come up, people create these absolutely beautiful puzzles, and we get to share them with you guys. Um, so now, what have we got? Well, we're starting to make some quite interesting progress. Now you can see, hopefully as as well, that whatever I put in this cell now, that's going to have to be the same as this cell. Ditto, ditto, ditto. So we're going to have diagonal propagation down the grid again. And that allows us to start thinking about um, some of the cages. So we need to think about this 10 cage in particular. I'm going to delete uh, everything in the grid because it's not actually likely to be correct because it was just illustrative. Now using this diagonal property we know that whatever we put in this cell here is going to make a reappearance on its diagonal. So it's going to make a reappearance in this square. Similarly, this square will make a reappearance in this square, and this square will appear here. Now what that means is that these three cells will sum to 10, and we're able to interact now with this 18 cage in column 8. So we've got 18 here, plus 10 more, which is these cells shifted downwards, is 28. So this cell and this cell must add to the difference between 45, which is the sum of the numbers from 1 to 9, and 28. So that's 17. Now there's only two, or only one way of making 17 from two digits in a Sudoku puzzle that's 9 by 9, and that's using the numbers 8 and 9. So all of a sudden, we have our first way into the puzzle. Now, what can we do with that? Well, what we can do is we can, we now know that all those cells are eight and nine. We don't know yet whether it's eight or nine. Now remember this, this, this grid is sort of toroidal now. So this cell also, because this is an eight or a nine, whatever this happens to be, this cell will be an eight or a nine. These cells must be eight and nine. And using the toroidal property that we've worked out it has, those cells are 8 and 9 as well. So, here we go. Now, can we do anything now to make more progress? Yes. So the place we need to look now is, is this row 1, where we have a 24 cage and 6 cells. So that means that, that this cell, this cell and this cell have got to sum up to 21. Now, we know this cell is an 8 or a 9, so if this cell is, ah, now we also, actually we know two things, we, because we know that we can't have an 8 and a 9 both in the 21 sum, so we can't use 4, 8 and 9, so I think there's only actually going to be very few ways that this works, there's going to be 8, 7, and 6, that's possible. If this was an 8, we could have 7 and 6 into these two cells. And the other way is going to be, if this is a 9, a 9 and a 7 and a 5, 9, 5, 7 is the only other way. So this cell is either 5, 6, or 7, using that logic, as is this cell. Which again allows us to fill in a lot of other cells with the numbers 5, 6, and 7. 5, 6, and 7 here. This cell, this cell, this cell. All of this diagonal must be 5, 6, and 7. Isn't it? I mean, isn't it extraordinary that a, a grid with no digits in it at all and a partial killer Sudoku can, you know, you can actually use logic to, de to develop a way of solving it. This is this. 
I'm just lost in admiration for this sort of thing. So, okay. So this 10 cage is now quite restricted, isn't it? Because now, obviously, if this was a 7, these would have to be 1 and 2. I mean, even if it's a 5, we're never seeing a big digit in either of these squares. Um, and we've also got a couple of other cages that we've not really looked into yet. So, what would be the most or the easiest way of sort of making more progress? Perhaps we should just assume a number in here and see what that looks like and see whether that takes us forward. So, if this was this is an 8, we now know that because these two cells are going to have to sum up to 13, without using an 8 or without using a 9, they would have to be 6 and 7. So, that's going to give us a lot of information about how this puzzle will develop. So let's, let's try and use that fact. We get rid of the fives from all of those squares. Now if this is an eight, we also know of course that all of these cells would have to be eight. And indeed all of these cells would have to be nine. As well as these cells. Okay. So we would end up with this arrangement. Now, can this work? That is the question. So this 26 cage is getting a little bit strained because we've got an 8 in it and we could add a maximum of 7 to it using this cell. That would give us 15. So we would need two more cells to add up to 11, but we can't use a 9, we can't use an 8, we can't use a 7, and we can't use a 6. So this cage is impossible. This 8 is not right. We can't fill this 26 cage if we use 8 in that cell. So let's go back, which is what something this software is really useful for. We now know that we've actually managed to place a digit. This is going to be a 9, and therefore this whole diagonal here is also going to be a 9. Let's put that in. And just as importantly, this whole diagonal and these three cells are going to have to be 8. Now, we also know now that these two cells are going to have to be um, 5 and 7 in order to give us our 21 total. So all of the five, six, seven cells in the grid, we can remove a six from. So let's also do that. Okay, that's looking good. Okay, so now let's, maybe we revisit this 26 cage now and see whether we can get to the right number. So if we were to put a seven in here, that would give 16. And we would need to make these two cells add up to 10. Now that's possible using 4 and 6. If we use a 5 here, we can never get to 12. So in fact, these two cells are exactly equal to 4 and 6 in some order. But I suspect we're now going to be able to work out that order because we're going to have an awful lot of information in the diagonals now. This square must be a 4 or a 6. And using the toroidal property, we know that, I think it's coming down like that, isn't it? This one, six, yeah. So think one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, one, two, three, four, five. This, this cell as well must be a four or six. There we go. Okay, so now, interestingly, in this 18 cage, we have a sum of 10. So we know this square is a one or a three, and again, let's let's use it. One three one three one three one three one three one three one three. Uh, is that all of the one threes? I think it is. Interesting to note. Okay, well let's use the twenty-eight cage now because we have a nine and a definitely twelve, which is twenty-one. So as this is a four or a six this must be a 1 or a 3 as well and that goes up this diagonal which gives us a lot of information 
one, two, three, just like this. And this corner square now must be one and three as well. You can see now we're starting to hone in on our last cage. Well, I suppose we've got two cages we can use, haven't we? We've got the 24 cage. In fact, the 24 cage is now fillable because we now know that we haven't yet placed a two in uh, in row one of the grid. So there we go. That has to be the two. And that is going to be lovely because that puts all these twos here. Now this... 10 cage is nearly right. 10 to 14. Ah, 20, 26 cage. That's going to be where we're going to find our answer. And you could see that it, it's necessary that this, this cage exists because it's the only place that disambiguates how these uh, how the entire rest of the grid will unfold. But you can see that now we have 19 plus this cell. So this cell is 7. Now the moment we place this 7, the whole of the rest of the puzzle actually unwinds. Look at that. The whole thing chains from that. All of those squares are 7. Now of course once we get the 7, we know that all of these squares entire leading diagonal we finally worked it out is five now the 10 cage helps us out with the ones and the threes this now must be the three which gives us these cells here and uh, let's make sure that we use the toroidal property this cell must be a three as well therefore um, and that means all of these squares are one and Okay, so now we know we're going to be able to work out the value of this cell now because now we've got 8, 24, this is going to have to be 4 and you can see that that allows us to write 4 into all those squares therefore everything else must be a 6 and this entire puzzle I think is filled, let's check it it's all looking good and this puzzle has a unique solution and I have to say, this is one of my favourite puzzles I've done this year. I think it is a sensational construction. And to have the idea of making a puzzle like this and then to execute it with so much aplomb, my hat is off to you, Andrew. That is a real achievement. Um, and I really hope you guys enjoyed solving it. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope for some of you it wasn't too trivial, for some of you it wasn't too hard, because definitely worth um, persevering with. You feel a bit like a, a magician revealing a trick when you do this because I think you know it's it's a really good thing um, to work through yourself and have that aha moment now I understand how this is even possible. Beautiful. Thanks very much for watching. We'll be back soon with another edition of Cracking the Cryptic.